Are we ready? Listo? Okay. Hello, everybody. Hola to todo el mundo. Hi. That was garbage. Just terrible. Try again. Ready? Uno, dos, tres. Hola. Hola. Ah, muchas gracias. I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for being here. We don't have a lot of time. I was hoping for four or five hours. They gave me just a little bit less than one hour. So, as always, I recommend that you start uh, our journey together. You start that journey with me by taking a photo of this slide. This slide has everything that you need to follow along later on at your own free time. It has the code, that's cool. It has my Twitter information and my email. How many of you are using Twitter? Twitter, 2019. Twitter, 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 Twitter. Okay, the rest of you, uh, what's the deal? <laughs> Come on, get on it. It's a great place to be. It's where all the developers that drive the open source that power your business are. It's the new IRC. It's, what, do you have some sort of alternative here? Is it like, like no Uber, so you have Yandex or something? You have no Twitter? Come on, come on, get on Twitter. What about email? Email, anybody here using email? Does anybody, does anybody use e email? email? No, I, I, don't, I don't, you know, I'm not really a big fan of email. It's better than nothing, I guess, uh, and I prefer it to Slack. I have a, a brand new MacBook Pro uh, 2018 with 32 gigabytes of RAM. 32 gigabytes of RAM, that's a very fast machine. One terabyte SSD, top of the line. The reason I have this is because I wanted to be able to run Slack and Chrome <laughs> at the same time. And I can almost do that. Only one Chrome instance, but I can do it, right? That's nice. So good stuff. A little bit about me. My name is Josh Long. I work on the Spring Team. I'm an open source engineer and contributor. I work uh, on a lot of different things. Uh, and before we get too far down the road, before we start too far, I want to take a selfie. Is that okay? Okay, good. You just pretend like you're happy, and, and then we'll take a photo together, okay? Uno, dos, tres. Sonria, okay. Okay, e otra vez. Open source. Ay, ya. Come on. Open source. Oh, it was so sad. Okay. Anyway. Uh, if you're in WeChat, that's how you connect with me in, in China, but we're not in China, so moving on. I have different videos that I've done. These are all five, six, seven hours of content on uh, Safari. They're, on, they're available for you to watch. I have a book called Cloud Native Java that I published last year. I'm very proud of this book. It took a little while to finish, but I'm very proud of it. It's about how to build applications that survive and thrive in the cloud using Spring Boot, Spring Cloud, and Cloud Foundry, among others. And the book is something that we worked on uh, for a good long time. We thought we would be finished in six months, but it, it actually, it took a little bit longer, just a tiny, just a little bit longer. It took a little bit longer to finish, okay? Not, not very much longer, just a, just a little bit, not very much at all, okay? Just a little tiny, not, I mean, it was, it was nothing. It was nada, you know, like little nothing, you know, just a very little delay, just a tiny, just, oh, it was like two years, okay? It was two years to get this crazy f book finished. But there's a good reason for that. We spent a lot of time having a long discussion, a very intense discussion with the publisher, O'Reilly. The, pub the discussion was about something very important when you write these kinds of books. The discussion was about something that matters almost more than anything else, the animal on the cover. <laughs> now, anybody who knows anything about O'Reilly books knows that it does not matter what's in the book itself. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Nobody ever reads these, right? If you look at all the reviews on Amazon.com, it's all about the animal on the cover. And so we knew, we knew that we had to find a very good animal. We eventually chose a bird, a bird with blue ears. It's a bird called the blue, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, oh, I forgot the name of my own bird. <laughs> I forgot the name of the bird. I've used that fact so much that now I've forgotten it. I'm not allowed to have it anymore. Uh, so cloud native, oh, cloud native Java. I know. Good thing we have a website. Okay. And then about, and where's the bird? Oh, blue-eared kingfisher. Okay, there you go. I've got the bird. It's a blue-eared kingfisher. It's a bird that is native or only found in the Indonesian Java islands in Indonesia. It's a bird that is only found in the Indonesian Java Islands. It's native to the Java Islands. And birds, they fly. Yes, yes, through the clouds. Through the clouds. So it's a bird that is native to Java, 
that flies through the clouds. It's, an, it's a cloud native Java bird. It's a bird. Never mind. It, it'll come. It'll come. Give it time. Um, there's that. I have a podcast every Friday uh, that I do on, uh, on just all sorts of stuff. We just got put onto Spotify today. So that podcast is now available on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, SoundCloud, etc. Beautiful podcast. Lots of good guests and everything every day. Join me there. Uh, we also have a, uh, a screencast series I do every Wednesday where I just look at some corner of the ecosystem. Uh, lots of different stuff there. It's a, a, a screencast that introduces different parts of the Spring ecosystem. Me at a keyboard for half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour, etc. Every Wednesday, okay? And there's, there's a lot of these for four years now. I've been doing them. Um, I have a new book, and this book is called Reactive Spring, and it's all about how to build applications that survive and thrive uh, in the, at scale, basically. How to take advantage of reactive programming. Now, reactive programming is a new answer to an old problem. The problem is, how do I scale? How do I handle more users? How do I handle more requests in my system? And we've had technologies that support this, right? We've, got, we've had ways to do this for a long time. Uh, most of us, when we do services, when we build APIs, when we do Internet of Things, when we do uh, you know, um, um, uh, NoSQL and big data, what we are dealing with is input and output. So the reason that we spend so much time on each of our threads as we scale out, the reason we spend so much time on our threads is because we use blocking, synchronous input and output. And so the obvious answer here is to move to asynchronous I.O. Asynchronous I.O. lets you ask for the data, but instead of waiting for the data, instead of just checking your watch, waiting for the data to come, instead of doing that, you ask for the data and then you get off the thread. And the data comes when it is available, but not sooner. Okay? This approach to working means that you have a selector thread. The selector thread starts, starts the conversation. It starts the, the request for the data, but then it, then it moves off the thread. It, it, it moves the processing of the eventual data to the background. The operating system handles it for you. This allows you to use your threads for other work. You can do other things with that thread. And this is a very powerful situation because we cannot create an infinite number of threads. It's very very expensive. So what we do by moving to asynchronous programming is we allow us to, to create more threads to, to easily uh, do the work, right? to do other work. This allows us with uh, asynchronous I.O. to handle more users at the same time. <clears throat> if the work that you are doing is input and output bound, if the constraint is input and output. Okay? Now, if you're doing Fibonacci or uh, cryptography, or uh, Bitcoin mining, or running Slack, then most of your work is going to be CPU bound, right? You're just going to sit there on the thread taking all the CPU, 150% Slack, right? And so this is problematic because you can't make that, you can't fix that with asynchronous I.O. It's CPU bound, not I.O. bound. So you can't fix everything. But if the work that you are doing is CPU bound, or sorry, I.O. bound, then asynchronous I.O. is a very good situation. The only problem is that it's a little bit more complicated. You're not just asking for data and then processing the data. You are asking for the data, then you move on to another thread. And then eventually, later on, the data comes back. So you have a callback, you have an interrupt. So what we need is some way to work with asynchronous streams of data, potentially unlimited asynchronous streams of data. This is where the reactive streams specification comes in. It provides four very simple types that allow us to describe asynchronous streams of data. Is that, is that good? Yes, of course it's good. And I think it's so useful, in fact, that uh, eventually the uh, reactive stream types were put into Java 9. So they're in the JDK itself. They, solve, they, pro they provide a, a, a solution for a problem that was in the JDK itself for a long time. I think that's very good, but it's very basic. Think of the reactive streams types as being sort of like asynchronous arrays. Very, very basic types. Okay? We don't use, most of us don't use Java arrays directly anymore. Most of us, I think, use Java util collections or even more uh, abstractly, we use Java age streams. Right? And these give us support for operations. They give us a little bit of safety. And they give us uh, uh, operators like filter, flat map, map, etc. So these things allow us to think about streams of data in a synchronous and blocking way. And we need the same thing for reactive asynchronous streams of data. So we have projects like Reactor from Pivotal. Reactor from Pivotal, uh, RxJava from Netflix, uh, Vertex from the Eclipse Foundation, Aka Streams from Lightbend. Lots of different uh, interesting projects out there that support these sort of asynchronous streams of data. And these provide operators on top of that. Is that enough? 
Is that all we need? Well, of course not, right? Again, what good is this new support, this new level of support, if the things that we use to deliver software every day, things that handle the uh, building of web services, things that handle transactions, things that handle database access, things that handle security, what good is it to have something like Reactor if the things that we use to deliver software in this way every day don't support those types? And so we need to have integrated end-to-end -end support. And this is where, for the Spring Team, the journey, the first step in the journey, began in September of 2017. We released Spring Framework 5, the first release to support natively end-to-end -end reactive programming. On top of that, we released Spring Data K, Spring Security 5, Spring Boot 2, and Spring Cloud Finchley. So today, we have an opportunity to look at how all these things come together and to see what the future holds for reactive applications. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to start here at my second favorite place on the internet after production. I love production. You should love production. You should go as early and often as possible. Bring the kids. Bring the family. The weather is amazing. It's the happiest place on earth. Production is better than Euro Disney. <laughs> but if you have not been to production, you can begin your journey here at start. That's spring that I owe. <laughs> if you need inspiration in the early morning before a cup of tea or coffee, start. That's spring that I owe. If your children are restless and they cannot sleep, start. That's spring that I owe. And if you suffer from indigestion, after a long night of alcohol abuse, to <laughs> too much sangria, and PHP. <laughs> Start that spring that I owe. So we're going to build a new application. We're going to call this the reservation hyphen service. And it's going to be an application that allows us to talk to or to describe data of type reservation. In order to build this application, I'm going to use the reactive web support. Here we are. I'm going to use Lumbuck to make Java a little bit more uh, concise. I'm going to use the reactive MongoDB support. I'm going to use the uh, RSocket support. And uh, that's it. OK, I'm going to hit Generate. That'll give us a new project. I'm going to open this project up in my IDE. And it doesn't matter what IDE you use. I'm going to use IntelliJ, but you can use Eclipse or um, uh, NetBeans or uh, anything, really, anything that supports Maven or Gradle and Java 8 or later. Now, I forgot. I forgot to do something very important here. It was something that I always do. You go to More Options, and then you're given a choice of which version of Java you want to use. You should be at least using Java 11. Arguably, you should be, probably be using Java 12, but at least Java 11, because that's the long, last long-term release. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go here into my code base, comment that out. There we go. And there's my application. I'm going to go to palm.xml. And you can see it says Java version is 1.8. Are you using Java 11? Everybody here should be using Java 12, right? Java 12? All of you? Java, OK, OK, that's awkward. What about, what about Java 11? You're all using Java 11, of course. Claro, right? Java, Java 11? Java, are you using Java? <laughs> I, I don't even understand. You, you know that Java 8's gone, right? It's very, very old. Very old. Don't use Java 11, uh, or Java 8, I mean. Don't use Java 8. Definitely use Java 11. Uh, or just stop using Java. I mean, that's, it's easier. You're, you might as well use a different language. Java 11 is completely way better. You should be using Java 11. It's great. You're going to love it. Go to Java 11. Um, it's also supported, and it's not end of life, and it's secure. So good stuff there, huh? Now, I've got a brand new application, and our application is a Spring Boot application. You've got MongoDB, you've got RSocket, you've got the web support, and you have test support. It's 2019. We assume that you will write tests. Now, can you see that font in the back? Let me make that font just a little bit larger here. I'm just worried that you can't see. Uh, maybe you're old like me, and you're unable to see things. So I'm going to make that a little bit bigger. Good. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build an application that writes data to the database, so class reservation. Here we are. It's going to be an object that maps data to the database. My database, in this case, is MongoDB. Uh, it's a, a, a database that's running in my local machine in the background here. I'm going to go Mongo and make that bigger. And you can see db.reservation.find. Actually, I just drop it. There you go. Reservation.drop. Okay. So now there's no 
you know, it's, it failed to find that stuff now, so it doesn't exist, right? So that's gone. I'm going to create an object that's going to map to a document. A document is a single row in a collection, which is like a table in MongoDB. It's going to have a primary key called ID and a field called name. Now this is Java, and I want some getters and setters, so I'm going to say this. I want some equals and hash code, good stuff. I'm going to create some getters and setters, good stuff, look at that. So modern. <laughs> so nice. Or maybe I won't do that. Maybe I'll use something like Lumbok. Okay, Lumbok's a compile time uh, con code generator, so I'm going to just add that there. And then I'm going to create a repository. And the repository, its job is to write data to the database. So I'll say repository extends reactive CRUD repository. Okay, managing data of type reservation whose primary key is of type string. Spring will provide an implementation of this interface that supports all these methods. You can see very useful methods here. Save, save all, find, find by ID, check if it exists, count, delete, etc. All these kinds of useful things. And these types, these method names, I mean, they should look very familiar. But these types, these are a little strange, aren't they? Publisher. A publisher comes from the reactive stream specification. A publisher publishes data of type T to a subscriber. So it's, it shares or broadcasts the data. And when I mean data, I mean a single byte, a byte buffer, a string, an int, a date, a long, an order, a customer order, a line item, whatever you want, right? It can be anything you want to broadcast that you have a stream of. So here, the subscriber consumes the data. You say subscriber.onnext, and then this gets called, right? Uh, when there is new data, on next is called. When there are new errors, on error gets called. And then finally, when you're done processing the data, on complete gets called. OK? Good stuff. So we have callbacks here for the different life cycle of data. Now, we don't treat errors as being special. They are not exceptional here. OK? They're just another kind of data, very functional in that way. Uh, we have on subscribe. This is called when the subscriber subscribes to the publisher. And in that callback, you are given a subscription. This is arguably the most important part of the API. This subscription is the thing that you can use to say to the producer, hey, slow down. No more. OK? I, I don't need any more data yet. I'm, I'm already too busy. I've got too much data. So the subscription can be used by the subscriber to say, I only want 10 more records, or I want to cancel all the data. OK? Now, that's three types. There's actually four types in the Reactive Streams API. Processor is the API uh, that provides a bridge. It's a source and a sync. It's a publisher and a subscriber, a producer and a consumer. It just connects one thing to another. It becomes, it's like a, um, um, uh, you know, a bridge, basically. So there we go. We've got those four types. Those are the basic types from the Reactive Stream specification. But you will notice that those are pretty boring, pretty basic, right? They don't have any operators. Like I say, they are synchronous, uh, asynchronous, rather, uh, 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 um, arrays, basically. And that, that subscription really is the most important part. The ability for us to say to the subscription, hey, no more data, please. That's called flow control. When you build distributed systems, you've got to think about flow control. This is a very important part of building robust, scalable services. Ever since we've had one computer talking to another, we've had to think about flow control. Just because you do not think about flow control sometimes doesn't mean it's not there. It just means you're doing a bad job. Right? It's very important to keep that in mind. It's always there. You can choose to ignore it, but it's always there. So when you use reactive APIs, it's a first level concept, a first top level concept. You have to think about flow control. In the world of reactive programming, marketing sometimes takes precedent over actual technical substance. And so in this case, the word back pressure has become very popular. Back pressure just means flow control. When you see back pressure, they're talking about an 80 year old idea. Okay? Nothing special about that. We're just talking about being responsible for our software. Okay? Now, I have these very basic types. They are very basic, like I say, uh, but they don't have operators. So we have two types from Project Reactor. Okay? This is a reactor, not the reactive stream spec. One is called a mono. A mono is not a monkey. That's important. A mono is a, uh, a publisher that produces at most one value. It's a single value or a, or a zero value. It's like a completable future that supports back pressure. We also have a flux. A flux is a publisher that produces zero to n or x values, where x could be unlimited, it could be five, it could be a trillion, it could be a hundred trillion billion, it could be whatever you want, right? It's any number greater than zero or actually including zero. So any number greater than negative one. Um, and that's it. Those are the reactive streams types. They provide operators like fil filter, flat map, map, and so on. So we're going to use them to write some sample data to the database. Sample data 
to the database like this. I'm going to create a Spring Bean. It's going to be a listener, application ready event. It's going to listen for public void go. It's going to be a at component. And I'm going to inject in my constructor a pointer to the repository. Now, I could do that. I could create a, a constructor like that. But I prefer, these days, I'm uh, very lazy. I like to use required args constructor from Lumbach. Okay? And now I'm going to say flux.just. I'm going to create some names. So A, B, actually, we'll do it this way. Olga, Josh, I'm going to think of some names here. Violetta, uh, Dave, Mad uh, Madura. Uh, okay, Stefan, okay, um, uh, Cornelia, and um, uh, Vinicius. Okay, good. So we've got now eight names, okay? Eight different names here added to my list of names. And I've created a reactive streams of the data. I'm going to map each name and turn it into a new reservation like this, passing a null. And that'll give me a new reservation <coughs> reactive stream. And I'm going to save each one of those into the database. So I'm going to say flat map. Actually, I'll say map first. I'm going to say uh, r uh, reservation repository save, passing an r. And that could be a, a method reference. And what that'll give me is a mono of t, mono of reservation. And so when I, when I run map, I get, a flat, I get a flux of mono of reservation. So instead, you use flat map. Flat map takes the intermediate type, it unpacks it, and there you go. Now, what I have defined here is a cold stream. Nothing has happened, right? Nothing is done yet at this point because I have not activated it. It's just like this Java 8 streams API. So you have to say subscribe, okay? Uh, or you could provide a, uh, a consumer. So I can actually create a logger using a lumbuck and I'll say log info. Good stuff. So there we go. So I've got a, lo I've got a logger. I'm logging out the data. I've got different streams of data. Now, when I run this program multiple times, I'll get the same data in the database multiple times. So what I really want to do is I want to say reservation repository dot delete all, right, to clean everything up. Then I'll say mono avoid. Well, I guess I can subscribe, maybe. That could work. But the problem with this is that this is asynchronous. The subscribe happens on different threads based on the scheduler. There's a scheduler that moves work across different threads. So I'm not going to say dot delete all dot subscribe. I want to force this to finish before the next line. Should I do this? No. No, 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 no. Danger, danger, right? Peligroso. Don't ever use this if you can avoid this. This is a terrible idea. When I see this, it makes me want to take a shower. <laughs> no, no, no. Instead, you use the operators. You say, then many. And then you pass in another publisher. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my publisher of data here, saved data. I'm going to chain these invocations together like this. OK? Good stuff. Now, did I go to my build already? Come on. What about auto refreshing? Good stuff. OK. So there we go. So there's my saved data. I'm going to now put this publisher here. And I'll say, delete everything, then save the data, then find the data. OK. And as the data arrives, I'm going to log it out. I'll use a, a method reference there to log it out. Good stuff, huh? Now, uh, once I start this application, let's go ahead and restart it. I'll take some water. <coughs> Alrighty, so there's the data. What do you think, huh? It worked. There's the data there. There's our data in there, right? Reservation.find. OK. Nice. There we are. Olga, Josh, Violetta, Dave, Madura, Stefan, etc. All of us are in the database. It worked. Of course it worked. It was a demo. What were you expecting? This was always going to work. That's not really what I wanted to talk to you about. What I wanted to talk to you about, as always, is this. This is the ASCII artwork in Spring Boot. This artwork took a long time to get right. We have people on the team that are doctors, doctors, PhDs, people who in their previous lives worked in nuclear physics. Very smart people. So it makes me very happy. To imagine that someday, somewhere, somehow, there was a GitHub issue and they said, we need, Git, we need good ASCII artwork. And I think you can agree. I think we can all agree they did a great job. <laughs> now, it's for this reason that I want to take a moment and talk about what I consider to be a very serious problem in the IntelliJ JetBrains uh, IDE. I like IntelliJ's Je uh, IDE, but look at this. Do you see this checkbox? <laughs> that one right there? That, that one? Do you see this? This one right here, do you see that? 
this one right here? That one? That one? When you click that checkbox right there, don't do it. When you click that checkbox, it suppresses the output of the ASCII artwork. What the hell? Why is this here? That's a dumb feature, IntelliJ. Nobody even asked for this. It's just a terrible thing. So I did what everybody would do. I went on the internet and I cried. And I was given a message of hope by my friend, Jan Sebrun. Oh, 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 he's trolling me. He's trolling me. Oh, <laughs> that's new. I was given a message of hope by my friend, Jan Sebrun, who's a developer advocate at JetBrains. And this is the message of hope that he gave me. He says, Josh, don't worry. He's a friend of mine. I've known him for many years. He says, Josh, don't worry. It'll be fixed in the next release very quickly. Just relax. Tranquilo, he says. Just relax. Be calm. But I'm, not, I'm starting to think that maybe, just maybe, just maybe. <laughs> maybe he's lying to me. I don't know. Anyway, that's hilarious. <laughs> um, anyway. I've got amazing ask artwork. I've got data in the database. Now, I'm using MongoDB. I like MongoDB. Spring Data supports a number of different reactive databases. It includes uh, Cassandra, MongoDB. It includes Couchbase and Redis. We have a good many uh, supported Spring Data databases, but only four of them for NoSQL are reactive. Now, how many of you are using MongoDB? OK, good stuff. It works. Um, what about SQL, SQL? How many of you are using a SQL data store? All right, right on. So most of us, I think, are, for now at least, and for the good foreseeable future, are using some sort of SQL data store. And so here we need to, we have some good options, right? We have some good options, but there's not really a good reactive option. So from the, we, we on the Spring team created a project called R2DBC. Uh, and R2DBC is a reactive relational database connectivity API. And there's some drivers for PostgreSQL, for Microsoft SQL Server, for H2. It's an SPI, OK? So this is the abstraction. And there are implementations for different databases. These are built on top of natively asynchronous database drivers. So it's not a facade on top of something existing. It's actually a natively reactive database driver. Uh, and there are other implementations, including for my, MySQL, right? MySQL uh, here, R2DBC. I even did a Spring Tips video about it here. So here's the code for my, reactive MySQL with JawSync and R2DBC on my Spring Tip video uh, GitHub repository. So all that stuff is there. And I'm going to use R2DBC. But the thing is, R2DBC is not yet GA. It's not general availability. It's not released yet. It's very close, and it's very good, but it's not yet GA. So I'm going to show you how to use it, but there is no auto configuration yet out of the box. Now, for that reason, I want you to think about R2DBC kind of like you would uh, PHP. Okay? Here's production. Here's PHP. <laughs> Never the two shall be meeting, ever. Never together, okay? Very far from each other. Eventually, soon, you can put R2DBC and production together. Never PHP. Very, <laughs> very important to keep that in mind. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and add this to my application, and I'm going to talk to PostgreSQL. Okay, cat desktop misc depths r2 uh, depths r2 dbc. I'm going to copy and paste these dependencies into my Maven build. So here we go. Here's the dependencies. I'm going to add. Here we go. I'm adding the dependency management section all the way down here. So that's the Spring Boot experimental r2 dbc dependencies. We're, you know, we're working on it right now. It's brand new. Um, and then here are the dependencies. R2DBC pool, Spring Boot starter R2DBC, Spring Boot starter data R2DBC, and also temporarily for now, we need this one, Spring uh, JDBC. Okay? Uh, you won't need that in the future, but you do need it now. So we've got that now on the class path. And all I need now is I need to configure, uh, I need to deprecate or to get rid of the MongoDB support. So I'll comment this out. There you go. Uh, and now we have an application that does not have uh, MongoDB. So of course, uh, our document annotation should no longer work. Let's rebuild our Maven build here. OK. Add this. And uh, we've got now um, uh, we've got a, a R2DBC application. Uh, where's the builder? Hello. Oh, there's a property up here. This property needs to be specified. 
an application that properties. So there you go. So spring r2dbc.url equals r2dbc colon postgresql uh, or username password shh, host name port database. Okay, so I'm going to connect to psql orders, and you can see I've got a bunch of tables. If I look on reservation, there it is. Delete from reservation. Good stuff. So now I've got the schema. It's got ID integer, not a string, and a name is a string. Okay, so I need to change my application a little bit here, um, and I'll change this to integer, and there you go. The only thing I need to change here is this. And now I've got an application that will talk to uh, R2DBC instead of MongoDB. So I'm going to change that a little bit here. Everything else should be the same. Let's go ahead and restart this application. I'll take some quick water. It's got to recompile. Oh, uh, that's why it failed. OK. Run. And now select all from reservation. There we go. Okay, so now I'm using reactive SQL-based data access. Good stuff. Okay, that's coming. There's more, and there's there's actually four other databases that I can't talk about yet that already have uh, RTUBC implementations that they're developing. Right. So these are we've got four right now. There's four more coming. All the big ones I think you're going to find. Um, almost all the big ones are are there. Okay. Um, good stuff. So now we've got reactive data access. I want to build a REST API. I could use this style. I could use the uh, regular Spring MVC style if you want, like this, private final reservation repository, and uh, inject the required args constructor, and uh, you know, good stuff, right? I can create all those endpoints if I want, and create a publisher, and just return the data. So like this, whoops, reservation, okay, like that. Nope, not delete all. That's the opposite of what I want. There you go. So there's a simple Spring MVC style. I like that style. It's very popular. But now that we have Java 8 as a baseline, we can also build functional reactive endpoints like this. So server response routes. And you say return route. OK. Good stuff. And you create an endpoint reservations. Shuns. And create a new handler function. And then you build. And here, I'm going to produce a response by injecting the reservation repository. OK? Good stuff. Body. And it'll be um, rr.findall reservation.class. All right, good stuff. So there we go. There's my new functional reactive sort of style. And of course, you can simplify this. You can use method references. Uh, you can use static imports. And then it becomes very concise. OK? So whatever style you want is up to you. Of course, um, when I start this application, you can see that the application uh, is, you know, it's very easy to write, very easy to get going, very fast, right? We're very quickly able to, re to iterate and so on. Um, let's see, reservations, there we go. There's our data. We can go to the JSON, you know, source to see that it's not actually, you know, I've got a plugin here that does that kind of stuff. Okay, so we've got data in the database. This is very simple, though. This is just eight records. Who cares about eight records? Uh, where where this API really comes into power, where it becomes very more very very promising, is when you do asynchronous streams of data. So let's say that I wanted to create um, WebSockets. Okay, so WebSockets is a very easy thing to do here. Let's create an un unlimited stream of data. Okay, I'm going to create a uh, unlimited stream of data, and I'm going to create a thing called a greeting producer and a greeting request and a greeting response. So I'm going to create a new service that just at, when you ask for a request, when you request a, a, re, a greeting giving a name, it'll actually stream back the data and we can use that. So I'm going to create a, a thing here. Get rid of this. This is the same type. And it'll be a spring bean. And here I'm going to say return a publisher of greetings response when somebody asks for a greetings request, or when they give a, re a greetings request, OK? And uh, in order to do this, I'm going to use the reactive scheduler, OK? So this is, this is in place. It's behind the scenes. And it's what allows Reactor to move work from one thread to another. You don't have to worry about that most of the time, but it is there, right? And if you want to change um, the, uh, the way threading works, you can override that. For example, here, I can say subscribe on and then say schedulers from Elastic and then blah, blah, blah. Right? You can actually provide your own executor service and all this. But you shouldn't need to do that most of the time, because by default, you have a thread pool that is based on uh, an event loop. Each thread is an event loop, and you have one thread per core. So now, I'm going to write, I'm going to create an endpoint that um, 
creates a new ending, never ending stream of data, like so. And I'll say stream.generate new supplier. And I'll say when somebody makes a new greetings uh, request, we're going to give them a greetings response by looking at the request.get name. So it'll be, uh, you know, when uh, the, I need the accent, but okay. Okay. Instant dot now. Okay. So I'm going to create a never ending stream. It's going to produce new values as fast as the consumer can consume it. So in this case, I'm going to slow it down a little bit by using the scheduler. It's right there. I can, I can slow down the time of this producer. Okay. So now I've got the producer. Now I want to create a simple WebSocket application. So class um, WebSocket uh, config. It'll be a simple URL handler mapping. Like so, return new simple URL handler mapping. Good. And it'll be a new, uh, a new uh, WebSocket handler. Okay. And this is where the business logic that, that we want to create lives. And then it'll be a new WebSocket handler adapter. And we just create that. Whoops. Turn new WebSocket handler adapter. Okay. So now the actual business logic lives in this WebSocket handler. And we're going to actually mount the endpoint here, we're going to say URL map, map dot of WS greetings. Okay. I'm going to inject a reference here to the WebSocket handler. WebSocket handler. I'm going to inject a reference to the WebSocket handler that we're going to build in that other bean method. Okay. So here's our WebSocket handler. Now what are we going to do? We're going to create a, we're going to take a request coming in from the client, the WebSocket client, the WebSocket client is going to connect, and they're going to create. A, it's going to create a session on the server, and so we're going to have, we're going to be given a callback here with a session. So we say session .receive, that gives us a publisher of WebSocket messages, and we're going to map each WebSocket message to the text, right? And we're going to take each one of those and turn it into a, a WebSocket a greetings request, right? So text to greetings request like this, text. I want to take each one of those and send it into the greetings. Uh, into the greetings producer, like this. I'm going to take each one of those, get one, each, each of the greetings responses, and get the message, and then take each text from the message and turn it into a WebSocket text message, like that. Okay. So there's my entire WebSocket application. Obviously, you can use uh, method references a lot here. It makes it cleaner and easier. Okay. And there's the the whole conversation var data. So receive the data, map it turn it into a response, and then you just send it. So you say send it like this, data. Okay. Now, in order to demonstrate this, I need to do something terrible, something that I'm not proud of, but I must do in order to demonstrate that this works, something that uh, I'm ashamed of, actually. Uh, so forgive me. I am going to write some JavaScript. Here we go. <laughs> WS.html. HTML body script window.add event listener load function e var ws equals new websocket ws local host 8080 ws greetings right and i'll say ws.add event listener load right sorry open when the socket connects for the first time the on open callback gets called and when there is new data the on message callback gets called so i'll say um, message I'm going to log out the data. New greeting. WS message. Okay. And here I'm going to take the inc I'm going to ask the user who should we greet? Who should we greet? And then I'll use that to send a response or send a request rather uh, to the WebSocket server like that. So the name will come in, then the responses will come back. So let's restart. Uh, and it was. WS greetings, is that correct? I think I did that. Yeah, WS greetings. So localhost ws.html. Whoops. Did I invalid uh, static WS body? There it is there. Window.add event listener. Feels like that should be right. WebSocket WS localhost 8080 WS greetings. Maven, make it re-import re everything. Window, okay. 
Am I missing something? Add event listener. listener. Load. On open. Is it actually calling the web server? Yeah, but I have to, it's supposed to ask here. What's the prompt? So it's not connecting? Wait, wait. Uh, Window.alert. Yo. <laughs> Means I. I get it. Yeah. No kidding. Ah, uh, the worst. Okay, that's there. So it's just not connecting. So add event listener. Uh, new WebSocket, WS local host on open, right? Window.prompt. Well, whatever. Let's try. Uh, Oh well, yeah, but it's supposed to. Yeah, sure. That's what I did. Unexpected failed. Oh w. Oh oh oh. Thank you. Ha. <laughs> you have to tell Spring, otherwise Spring doesn't know and it doesn't care. Okay. There we go. So now, good stuff. So now we have this code here. Um, get rid of that. Window dot prompt. Who should we greet? Okay. So, um, uh, Jan, my friend Jan. There we go. Oops. Dot data. Jan. There we go. So now we're streaming data forever. Ever and ever and ever, every second, a new, a new piece of data. In between, we're not, use we're, we're not keeping the thread. We can reuse the thread for other requests. This allows us to scale more, to handle more users with the same computer. Now, we have about 10 more minutes. Let's wrap this up quickly with a quick client. Okay, so I've got a server here. Let's go back to start.spring.io. I'm going to build a reactive client, so reservation hyphen client. Okay, and I'm going to use our socket here. I'm going to use Lumbach. I'm going to use the reactive web support, and there we go. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create an edge service. An edge service is a thing that you know it proxies data to the downstream service. It changes the requests and normalizes them for the downstream service. Uh, and I'm just going to create one of those here very quickly. It's going to run on a different port. So my regular service is running on port 8080. This will run on port 9090. So I'll say that 9090 here. And it's going to be a gateway, kind of. So I can do a lot of different things here. Maybe I create a new functional reactive endpoint like this, server response, route. OK, and I can say return, route, good, build. And you need to say dot git forward slash reservations. And I'm going to create a new endpoint that just has the data names only the names of the people. So there's not actually the JSON. I'm going to change it because maybe I have a, an iPhone or Android or PlayStation or whatever, and the client cares about only the names. So in order to support this use case, I'll create a reservation client like this. Okay. Well, in order to create that reservation client, in order to create a lot of clients, I'm going to do something terrible, something that you should never ever do, not even when you are all by yourself at home and no one is looking. I am going to copy and paste some code. So here's this. Get rid of that. And then I want the greetings, requests, and response. So here's this. Good. Good stuff. So we've got now a different number of different types. This is going to include a component. It's going to be a component. And it's going to handle, it's going to make requests for the reservation service. So get all reservations, like this. In order to make this request, I'm going to use the reactive HTTP web client. Okay, And I can inject this into the constructor. At required args, good. In order to create that bean, I need to I need to factory it. I I can say web client dot web client dot this dot builder builder return builder dot build. So I'm in creating a web client by injecting the builder and then building it. I can can I can generically contribute filters and things like that here, but this is fine. Okay, so I've got a reactive web client, and I'm going to say okay, make a reactive HTTP call on the client side to a uh, git URL HTTP localhost 880 forward slash reservations, and then retrieve the data and the body to flux.class. Okay, so now I'm going to use this. I'm going to create a new API uh, adapter. I'm going to change the data by injecting the reservation client here, and I'll stream the changed data back to the client, my edge service client. Okay, so RC, and I'll say, okay, let's call that downstream service. 
rc.getAllReservations.map reservation get name. I'm going to save all of this into another stream. Whoops. Just that. Come on. Uh, good. There's my publisher of names. So I'll say server response dot okay dot body names string dot class. Okay, not bad. Clean that up. Send that back. Uh, I want to send back just the names. That's not a big deal, right? That's not a big deal. What about if I wanted to send back the uh, the greetings? The greetings are never ending, right? The greetings are an infinite stream of data. So how would I send that back? Well, I could use uh, server send events or web sockets. I guess I could call. I could create another client that calls that endpoint. If I created another endpoint, I could do that. But that would be using HTTP. And I think HTTP is a nice protocol. It's a very good document retrieval protocol. The problem is that it's not a very good application protocol. It supports request, response, request, response, request, response. But how do you do producer, consumer, node to node, right? Peer to peer. How do you do bi directional, long lived connections? How do you say, I want to send a single value in and get a stream of values back? Well, WebSockets, that's an, ex that's an example. You send a, a request in and you get a single, you get multiple values back. How do you do security with WebSockets? Anybody here know? There's no one answer. You have to make it up, right? There's no protocol. The protocol for WebSockets doesn't have headers. You're missing one of the most important things that you need to describe tokens, for example. That doesn't exist in WebSockets. What about if you want to send uh, uh, binary data over service and events? How can you do that? Well, again, you have to base 64 encode it because HTTP by default assumes text. So these, these concerns make it pretty inefficient. And it also means that some of these common message exchange patterns that we depend on to build high-scale services don't work. A lot of different organizations have tried to solve this problem. Google created something called gRPC, which is an RPC framework. The thing with that is that it requires you to use Google protocol bus, which is OK. You know, it's not bad. But, but anyway, I'm a fan of something called rsocket. rsocket is a protocol from Facebook. Facebook wanted to solve, do you have, do you have Facebook? You have, your own, you have your own Facebook, like Yandex? You have the index book, something like that. Anybody? I don't use Facebook. I'm not a fan. I don't care. But there are people that do use it, and um, they are apparently very popular in some parts of the world. Okay, and uh, so they have to scale, and so they use they look they were using HTTP and they were looking for ways to go to bigger and further heights. So they created a protocol called RSocket. RSocket is a binary protocol. It's built from the ground up to support reactive APIs. And it also supports not just back pressure from the consumer to the producer, but also it advertises information about the health of the service. Our socket also supports four different message exchange patterns. So send a single value in or, or a stream in and get nothing back. That's fire and forget. Send a single value in, get a stream back. Send a stream in and get a stream back. Right? Or send a single value in and get a single value back. So four different exchange patterns. Uh, and it's also duplex. It's also multiplexed, I mean. It supports long-lived connections. Uh, it's binary by default, so you don't have to, you don't have to like, do all this stuff to get JSON to be efficient or to get XML or whatever to work. So it's a very interesting protocol. And of course, they built different clients to support this protocol. The clients are written in Java, JavaScript, and C++, among others. The Java client built by Facebook uses Reactor. Okay, so they wanted to scale. They built a Java client based on Reactor. And this was built by the team from Netflix that knew how to build distributed systems, by the way. They, 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 built on, they worked on Arcs Java. They worked on uh, you know, the Hystrix and Eureka and all these kinds of things. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a rsocket-based controller here. Spring Framework 5.2, which is what we're using right now, the new version. It's not yet GA. It's coming out in a few months. Supports rsocket. So I'm going to say controller re, uh, greetings rsocket controller. Okay. And we're going to create an endpoint. We're going to send a greetings response when somebody sends a greetings request. Okay. And in order to do that, I say message mapping. And I give it a greetings sort of string. It's not a URI exactly, but it's a thing, very similar. And producer. And I'm just going to inject that here. And I'll say, I want to say this dot producer dot greet request. All right, that's my server. That's it. All I need to do there is start the rsocket server on this port. Whoops. rsocket server port will be 7070, OK? So I'm creating a, a new port, not just HTTP, but I've also got rsocket started up here now. On the client side, I need to do the same thing in reverse. I need to create an rsocket requester. So here, I'm going to use the rsocket requester dot builder. And it's the same idea. I say builder dot connect TCP client transport on port. 70, 70. All right. So now I'm going to create a new endpoint. End oh, I need to block. Yeah. 
You wouldn't normally do that. You'd just have one instance. OK, so I'm going to create a new endpoint. And this is not going to use WebSockets. Instead, I'll use service and events. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to stream the greetings. So I'll create a greetings client as well. And here, it's going to be a publisher of greetings responses on the client side, on the edge service, when somebody sends a greetings request. So here we go. Private final R socket requester at uh, component at uh, required args constructor. Okay, and I'll say return this dot requester dot greet or dot route greetings. And then the data that I'm going to send in will be the request, and the data that I expect back will be greetings response data. Okay, so there's my reactive stream of data. And we're going to use that to create a very quick service and event stream. So, re so greetings for a person. Okay, new handler function. We'll say server response dot okay dot body, and I'll inject the greetings client. Greetings client gc gc dot greet new greetings request, and the request will be the name in the path variable. Okay, so I'll send that back, and I'm going to send that here. I'll say. The content type will be service and events, not just application JSON, text event stream, and I'll send that back. So name, greetings, response.class. And there's my edge service. Let's go ahead and restart this. Now keep in mind, the nice thing about reactive APIs is that you get all these operators to help ensure that you have more robust code. So when an exception happens, you can say, I want to fall back and provide a fallback value. You can say I can do retries and then back off, you know, it'll do exponential back off. Every second it'll grow more. So you have these nice operators as well in reactive APIs that you don't get when you're doing synchronous stuff by default. Okay, go ahead and run this. This is on port 9090. So we go to the browser, localhost 9090, and I call this, uh, what did I call this? Greetings name. Uh, GBCN. Alrighty, so I'm now streaming reactively over the network using this binary protocol called RSocket from my reservation client to my reservation service. I'm sending data right on the wire, across the wire, no problem. I have full support for back pressure built into the protocol, which you don't have when you do HTTP. Right? It's, now, uh, it's now much more efficient. I can do all sorts of very interesting things here. And then I'm sending that reactive stream back as HTTP. I'm adapting it. I'm changing it. You don't have to do that, but it's just an interesting demo that because everything is reactive, these things just link up very naturally. I can bridge one source and one sync very naturally. I hope you learned something from this. I hope you got something out of this. Obviously, I'm a big fan of this. How many of you learned something? OK, how many of you liked it? Good stuff. OK, good. I'm glad to hear that too. Obviously, I'm a big fan. I'm wearing spring t-shirt and spring underwear. Obviously, very big fan. But. You don't have to take my word for it. There are lots of organizations that are using the Spring, uh, Spring Boot, Spring Cloud, and the reactive support. Many organizations, including Netflix, they just announced last November they're going full in on Spring uh, and Spring Cloud and Spring Boot. Uh, Alibaba are using RSocket and Spring Boot and Spring Cloud everywhere, right? Um, uh, Facebook, obviously, we talked about their use of Reactor and so on. So there, there's a lot of different organizations, and of course, all the different banks and small, you know, insurance companies, media companies, all that kind of stuff. But large companies as well at scale, the ones that need to get to production faster. Your organization is the same thing. You have to get to production faster. You have to build better software, safer and faster. And so at the end of the, at the, end of the day, the best choice, I think, these days, for a lot of people, is the Spring and Pivotal stack. Gracias, Pere Venir. Gracias, amigos. I have uh, no time, but I'll take questions over there. Gracias. Thank you so much.